you can do great work in fundamental science, as exemplified by Niels Bohr. When he was working on the quantum mechanics of the atom, he didn't think it would have any direct application. Although 20, 30, 50 years later, the quantum mechanics led to the invention of the laser and the invention of the transistor. You could not have invented those two things unless you knew what Niels Bohr and other colleagues were developing. But it took a while. There could be other things like Thomas Alva Edison, who was directly trying to invent things that could be applicable in a year or two. Or you can do Pasteur's quadrant. Louis Pasteur was pushing back the frontiers of science, as was Madame Curie. But they were also doing things that were immediately applicable. For example, uh, pasteurization and rabies shots and radiation treatments of cancer. So immediately applicable things they also did. And so what we need to do is figure out how to get our best scientists and engineers to be in this quadrant. Well, so I look back at historical records of what has been done in the past. And I'm drawn to laboratories like the Lincoln Laboratories. During World War II, that laboratory invented, or didn't invent, but developed the radar. And also Los Alamos, uh, which was making the bomb. And in Los Alamos, for example, you see some brilliant scientists. Uh, this is Enrico Fermi. This is, uh, that's Feynman over here. Uh, incredible scientists, OK, going into a seminar. Now, in both of these instances, now I'm old enough to have actually known personally many of the people who worked at Los Alamos and Lincoln Labs. And so you know, they told me stories about what was life like. And life was incredible. They're brilliant scientists, brilliant engineers working side by side, and they had to deliver the goods. They didn't have 10, 15 years to develop something. They actually had to deliver it because it was a wartime emergency. Uh, another great organization was Bell Laboratories, which I spent nine years at. Bell Labs invented a lot of things, the photovoltaic cell, invented radio astronomy and satellite communications, invented the transistor, the laser, information theory, uh, just recognized in this year's Nobel Prize, the charged couple device that makes digital cameras. Fifteen scientists who worked at Bell Laboratories went on to get Nobel Prizes, which is even more remarkable because they always hired these people when they were very young. I was hired when I was 30 years old. I was not a proven quantity. And in fact, when I was hired, there were about four dozen of us that were hired about the same time within three or four years. Five of us had Nobel Prizes. Two-thirds of us are now in the National Academy of Sciences. There was something in the water of the laboratories. <laughs> uh, um, and I'll tell you what was in the water. The managers were the best practicing scientists. When I was a department head of Bell Labs the last four years, I actually had a lab. And that's where I started the laser cooling trapping that got a Nobel Prize. I, would, I only spent 20% of my time managing the laboratory. But because I was a practicing scientist and because and part of my job was I had to know what was happening company-wide in terms of research. And so these managers, department heads and directors, had an intimate knowledge of what people were doing in different areas. And they were the link. They were constant. I was constantly saying, you know, what you're doing, you should talk to so-and-so over there in Murray Hill or in Homedale and greasing the skids. How did I know about that? Well, I learned because every time I'd go and have lunch and I'd sit down at a table and you know, we talked about what we were doing. Um, so what was typically a social event became a technical event. And everybody ate lunch in the cafeteria. Even if you brown bagged it, you brought your brown bag to the cafeteria and you sat down and you ate. And the journal clubs and tea times and tennis courts and all these other things, they were very, very frank, sometimes brutal discussions. But it was a very, very exciting atmosphere. The most important thing, though, was the managers were the best scientists. And they made very fast decisions on what to fund and what not to fund, because they knew exactly what was going on on a weekly, daily basis. So instead of writing a proposal, waiting a year, and then the next three years to come up with something so you can get refunded. So you can go off in new directions very, very quickly. Um, the laser cooling and trapping idea, I went to my, I was in an apartment head, went to my director and said, I think I want to do this. I was starting off in a different direction kind of looked at me and said, well, OK, you can do that. Just don't try to talk other people into doing that. Because there was a program of eight years going where there was no success. I said, you're allowed to do it. You've earned the right. But don't try to convince anyone else to do this, uh, because it's going to fail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so I started doing this uh, with my, just my technician and, 
um, and my postdoc. And then after six months, I said, it looked like it was going to work, so I went quietly to the other people and said, come on, join up, it's going to work, and said, okay. <laughs> so, so this is an example. This is what I looked like. I, too, was young once. <laughs> Well, I was about 32 at Bell Laboratories. And so these are some of the people who, who uh, were there who went on to get Nobel Prizes. Um, because of my experience at Bell Labs, because of the stories I've heard of at Los Alamos and the Metallurgical Lab at University of Chicago and Oak Ridge and at Lincoln Labs, um, we are starting a number of research and development things. One is called the Innovation Hubs. Um, I prefer the name Bell Lablet, but never mind. And so. What we want to do is we want to give, we want to make, get some of the very best scientists to say, I want to sacrifice part of my career to make this happen. And you can pick a field like advanced building technologies or artificial photosynthesis where sunlight can be turned directly into transportation fuel. And that scientist and the team under them would then be given substantial amount of funds, 25, 30 million dollars a year, and we'll say, go ahead and go in this broad outline of things, you decide what to do, run it like Los Alamos or Bell Labs or Lincoln Labs was run. We're not going to tell you, we're not going to micromanage. You get it for five years, renewable for 10, and after 10, unless you're truly spectacular in the upper 5%, you're closed down. But you, we want you to deliver real solutions. We don't want you to deliver just scientific papers, but real solutions that industry picks up. A lot of excitement. I think this is an experiment. I hope it works. There's a precursor to that. Uh, and there are three biofuel centers that had started in the Department of Energy. I, it, one of them was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And we're developing new ways uh, of breaking down lignocellulose. This is this woody material in grasses or in crop residues like wheat straw or corn cobs. This is the amount of grass that's grown in one growing season. You mow it down, next year it pops up again. The remarkable thing about this much biomass is it comes without irrigation, without fertilizer. So the input, the energy inputs are greatly reduced. Um, this is a test station in University of Illinois, which was one of our collaborators, and it yields um, 15 times more ethanol than corn without the energy inputs of the fertilizer, and you don't have to plow because it's perennial and grows back and it fixes its own nitrogen. Um, we don't use these things now because it costs too much to break down this stuff, but, but uh, the other thing is this new energy center, first six months of it turning on, the scientists there, brilliant scientists in synthetic biology, reprogrammed yeast and bacteria called E. coli, and put in hundreds of genes and, and transcription factors and other things so that if you feed the yeast or bacteria sugar, instead of making ethanol, uh, they made gasoline fuel, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. Uh, so the yield is low, but it only took six months to do that, and for the next five years, can you get the yield up so it's commercially viable? But it, the point here is that when you get really brilliant scientists who have a mission, you can go, f and you give them the money and freedom, you can go much faster. So uh, that's what's happening. Finally, we have to act now. There's an energy and climate bill before Congress that passed through the House. It's now before the Senate. This would be our carbon emissions and business as usual trajectory in the United States. And comprehensive energy bill is one where you put a cap on carbon. First, it, it encourages energy efficiency and allows programs like the ones I've described to get started. It encourages renewable energy and cleaning up older forms of energy like coal so you can capture the carbon. But it also has to put a long-term signal in place. And the long-term signal is that we're going to put a cap on carbon, and it's going to slowly ratchet down over the next 50 years. And with that long-term signal, if you're a utility company CEO and board, you will say, OK, if that's the long-term signal, do I invest my $2 billion in a new coal plant, or $2 billion in a gas plant, or $2 billion in a coal plant with carbon capture, $8 billion or $7 billion in a nuclear power plant, or how much wind do you want? And so you may start making adjustments. But these things last 50, 60 years. 